just want to thank everyone for coming on tonight. We have 300 participants, so thank you everybody for signing on tonight. And uh, we have two great presenters. Um, our first presenter is Dr. Shane Shapira, who is an associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. He's currently the director of the Intertitial Lung Disease Program at the Toronto General Hospital, UHN. He also works for the Toronto Lung Transplant Program, providing pre-lung transplant assessments for patients with intertitial lung disease. Thank you very much, Dr. Shapira. Thank you very much. It's a thrill to be here. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Are you seeing and hearing me okay? Yes. Great. I'm sorry you can't actually see my face, but I promise I'm going to be super animated and you're all going to miss that, but I'll keep my voice up and down to keep the energy going. Um, it's a real treat to be here today to talk about uh, IPF treatment. Um, here are my disclosures. Uh, so I I'm going to have four objectives today during our talk. Oops, sorry. Four objectives today during our talk. The first is to give you some background information about interstitial lung disease and uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I'm going to use the short forms of ILD and IPF going forward. Um, the next, I'm going to explain how we used forced vital capacity to monitor our patients for progression of their disease. We're going to review general principles that apply to treatment of all chronic lung diseases, but certainly are uh, really relevant for our IPF patients. And then we're going to explore some of the data between IPF-specific therapies. But before I start, I have to define a few medical terms because we have to make sure we're all talking in the same language. So what do we mean when we talk about ILD or interstitial lung disease? And I really like this picture on the left. This is a picture of the lungs. What you can see here is the blue is the blood vessels. Um, the line stuff is the airways. And then you see this other part all around. And, and so I'm going to show you that this piece right here on the right is actually a true uh, electron micrograph of a lung, whereas the left is the drawing. And essentially what you're seeing here is, is that little thing that looks like a, 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 a sideways V going to the right, that's an airway. And all these little bits where you see holes and lines and all this honeycombing stuff, that is the lung tissue itself. We think of that as the interstitium. The other way to describe it is the scaffolding that kind of holds the blood vessels and airways in position. So that's what the interstitium is. Now the question is, what is an interstitial lung disease? Well, interstitial lung diseases are chronic progressive diseases where you get scarring of this scaffolding of the lung. The causes of those interstitial diseases can be known. So there are some well-known causes of lung scarring like scleroderma, asbestosis, farmer's lung. And then the cause can be unknown like it is in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. The two things I'm going to say is that today we're really only going to focus on IPF. That's the goal of today's talk. So I'm going to focus all of my talk on that. And when we say that IPF is unknown, I don't think that's really a good description. That's probably where we were with IPF maybe 20 years ago. We now know that idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is probably due to a combination of certain genes that make your lungs do this abnormal scar tissue formation. And that scar tissue will just grow over time. So why do we care about it and why is it bad? Well, as the scaffolding gets scar tissue in it, the lungs become stiff. And with stiff lungs, there's more work to breathe and that gives people a feeling of breathlessness. At the same time, as the lungs get that scarring, it becomes more difficult to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide, and so patients can get low oxygen levels. And then finally, because these conditions tend to be progressive, the lung function will get worse over time, and so this is quite a serious illness. IPF is actually the most common form of ILD, and that's part of why we picked it for today's topic. Particularly, it's the most common form in people over the age of 50. It's thought that there's about 14,000 patients in Canada who have IPF. And the diagnosis is pretty uncommon in people under 50. And you can see on this graph on the left, you can see the percentage of people who have ILD in an ILD clinic, how many of the patients have IPF. And you can see as the patients get older, 
the rates of IPF as a diagnosis go up substantially. What's interesting about IPF and, and actually a little bit worrisome for us is that we would expect IPF to become more common over time because the Canadian population is getting older. But we seem to be seeing an increase in rates of IPF that are independent of the demographic shifts. What I mean by that is that even though we would expect to see more IPF over time as the baby boomers get older, we're actually seeing even more IPF than would be expected simply by that aging alone. And that tells us that there may be something that's putting people at higher risk of getting IPF now than 20 or 30 years ago. Now, how IPF behaves over time is really quite unpredictable. You know, we have some patients, if you look at this red line, who take a relatively stable path. They get worse, but it's very slow. Then the blue line shows people who progress kind of slowly over time. And then this purple line can show people who progress really quickly. But at the same time, patients don't necessarily stay in their lane. There can be some people who are relatively stable who suddenly have an acute worsening. They may stabilize, but they may not gain back that lung that they lost during, a worse, uh, during their worsening. Other people may have a flare where they get worse, but then they suddenly get a lot worse and they never really stop progressing. And they can, get, uh, they can even die during these flares of IPF. So although we talk a lot about averages and how people do on average, the reality is that for every single patient, their experience is very different. So how do we assess patients with IPF? So I'm using this picture as a, an example. You can imagine that these lungs are breathing in and out. You're seeing the lungs breathe in and out. And as they're doing that, you can see the red line goes up and down. And this is our volumes in our lungs as we take breaths in and out. It's called tidal volume. Now I want you to imagine that instead of doing regular breathing, you start breathing heavier and heavier. You start breathing deeper and deeper and deeper until eventually you get to the point where you're breathing from all the way full to all the way empty. This amount of air going from all the way full to all the way empty that's called the vital capacity. And we're gonna talk a bit more about this vital capacity on the next slide. So as the lungs stiffen, they start to shrink as they get scarred down. And as the lungs shrink, this vital capacity will get smaller and smaller over time. We can actually measure this vital capacity or VC and the way we do that is these breathing tests that you're all familiar with, where we ask patients to force the air out of their lungs. And this, this volume that we measure is called the forced vital capacity. That's when you go from as full as you can go to as empty as you can go. And because this is a measure of how much the scarring there is in the lungs and how much volume there is in the lungs, we know that as the vital capacity drops, that tells us that a patient's ILD is getting worse. In IPF, we actually know that if your FBC, that's this force vital capacity, if that drops by more than 10%, there's an increase in one-year mortality in that group. And you can see this paper from 2003, where the patients who were stable, that's the blue line, the percent for survival was much higher than the green line, where the people had a 10% drop in their lung function. So now we've talked a little bit about what IPF is, how we measure it and monitor it. The next thing to do is to talk about how we treat IPF. So as far as the treatment re recommendations go, I'm going to have four different categories. I'm going to talk about things that have a strong recommendation for their use. That gets two thumbs up. There's gonna be things that have a conditional recommendation for their use. That's stuff that we think works, but the data is not as strong. That gets one thumb up. Stuff that we recommend against gets one thumb down. And stuff that we're really confident is not helpful for our patients, that gets this symbol right here. So the first treatment recommendations that we make for all our patients, not just our IPS patients, is to quit smoking. This is 
obviously kind of intuitive and everybody knows that your lung doctor is going to tell you to quit smoking. But there's a few reasons specifically why our, our, our IPF patients have to quit smoking. First, IPF is associated with a higher risk of lung cancer on its own. And when our patients with IPF smoke, they get an even higher risk of lung cancers. On top of that, if you have IPF with other lung problems like emphysema that come with smoking, we know those patients are at a higher risk of needing oxygen, that are a, they're at a higher risk of getting complications like something called pulmonary hypertension. And we think that these patients actually have a shorter survival if they have combined IPF and emphysema. So obviously, all of us would recommend that if you're smoking, do what you can to quit. Our second recommendation is for pulmonary rehabilitation. So when we send our patients to exercise for pulmonary rehab, the goal of that rehab is to improve muscle strength and cardiovascular fitness. But at the same time, when you go to these sessions and you're meeting with other people with your disease and you're talking to respiratory therapists, our secondary goals are that you will improve your knowledge about living with lung disease. We also think that this will help reduce social isolation and emotional isolation. A lot of patients talk to me about how they want to strengthen their lungs. And I often tell them that we're not looking to strengthen your lungs. That's not really the goal of our exercise program. You know, your lungs are an organ like your kidneys and your liver. Like no one thinks to themselves, oh, I've got to go to the gym so that I can make my kidney stronger. You're not going to pee any better after going to the gym. And the same way with your lungs, you can't make your actual lungs stronger. But instead, what you do is by exercise, you allow your muscles to function efficiently in this low oxygen environment. I kind of draw the analogy to people who climb Mount Everest. You know, if you try to climb Mount Everest, there's low oxygen levels at the top of Mount Everest. Most people will go to Mount Everest for a month at base camp before they do the climb. That doesn't change how much oxygen there's getting into their body when they go to the top. But by spending a month at Mount Everest exercising, they're teaching their muscles how to work in that low oxygen environment and they become more efficient. The third recommendation is to use oxygen and to treat if patients have low oxygen levels at rest. There's a lot of debate about when the right time is to start patients on oxygen, because although oxygen can sometimes make you feel better, it's also a really big nuisance. You know, having tanks and having oxygen tubes is very challenging for our patients. So in general, our feeling is that we want to use oxygen for sure if people have low oxygen levels at rest. What's much more controversial is whether or not we should be using oxygen when people are having low oxygen levels only with exercise. So they're fine at rest, but their oxygen level goes lower at exercise. We don't really know if using oxygen in that scenario helps people. It can sometimes help with symptoms, but it's not clear yet if the risks and benefits are outweighed uh, and where the balance is. So this is something that everyone should talk about with their doctor and decide when is the moment to say, okay, my oxygen levels are low enough that it's worth it for us to use oxygen to make me feel better. The next thing I wanna talk about is the importance of treating the psychological aspects of IPF. You know, it's really important that we do what we can to provide our patients with education and support. And these kind of meetings where we have support group meetings and information sessions, these are really essential for our patients. But one of the challenges is that in 2021, everyone seems to think that they can just go to the internet and get all the information they want. And I was really fortunate to be part of a group uh, that this paper came out of uh, uh, Dr. Fisher, who's one of the uh, respirologists who works in our program. She did this really clever paper where what they did is they typed IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis into all three major search engines, Google, Bing, and Yahoo. And then what they did is they went through the top 100 hits and they graded those sites to see how much information they had that was present and how much of that information is correct. I don't expect you to really see this table. I know it's really tiny, but the point that I wanna tell you is that each little square on this table is a piece of information on a specific website. If the specific piece of information was correct 
and was present, that, that little box got put as a dark gray box. And I just want you to see out of all the hundreds of websites we looked at, how many spots were light white and light gray because either the information was not present or it wasn't correct. In fact, we found that about half of the websites we looked at made recommendations for treatments which were not correct. So you have to be really cautious about where you go for your information. I would recommend that you go to websites like the Canadian Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation website and the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation in the US. These are sites that are vetted. And in fact, after this paper came out, um, we were asked to go through the CPFF website to make sure that their information was correct. And, and we did that. As I mentioned, support groups are a key way to educate and reduce social isolation. And I think we can't ignore depression in our patients. You know, depression is really common in patients with IPF. It affects, it's thought up to 25% of patients and it's often under-recognized. It's not a patient's fault if they get a serious diagnosis and they have a lot of serious symptoms and they feel depressed about it. That's perhaps even a normal reaction. But eventually over time, that feeling can lead to chemical imbalances in the brain that make it very difficult for patients to get out of that funk. And so we recommend that we should consider referring to psychology or psychiatry really early if patients are having real depression. The last thing that I want to talk about as a general recommendation that applies to all lung diseases is to talk about vaccination. And in particular, we need to talk about vaccines in the era of COVID-19. So a brief review of how COVID-19 interacts with people with pulmonary fibrosis. I'm gonna tell you right off the bat that patients with pulmonary fibrosis do not do well if they get COVID-19. This is the best paper that's come out so far. Um, there's analysis, of, this was an analysis of 161 patients who were admitted to European hospitals with COVID-19 between March and May of 2020. Patients with ILD in general had a much higher mortality from COVID-19 than patients who did not have ILD. The mortality in IPA, ILD patients who were admitted to hospital with COVID-19 was as high as 49% versus 35% in the non-ILD controls. And patients with IPF were even at a higher risk of death. In the IPF group, the mortality from COVID-19, if you were sick enough to need hospitalization, your mortality was as high as 60%. This is really important because it tells us how much we need to try and avoid our patients getting COVID-19 at all costs. Now, a lot of patients will have concerns about the vaccine. They'll say, well, I've previously had a bad reaction to the flu shot, or I'm nervous about getting a vaccine that's so new, or I'm worried that my IPF will flare if I get the vaccine. And I hear these concerns all the time. And on top of these concerns, there are many components of the vaccine rollout that are unclear. You know, we don't know when we're gonna start vaccinating the general public. We don't know if patients with lung diseases will be given higher priority. We don't know if patients are gonna get it from their doctor's offices or at community centers. But although there's all these unknowns, there's one thing that is very clear about the COVID-19 vaccine. In my mind, when you have a disease that causes a very high mortality, Unless the vaccine is terribly dangerous, everybody should get it. And in particular, my recommendation is that every IPF patient should get the COVID-19 vaccine as soon as possible. IPF patients are at very high risk from the virus and the vaccine poses minimal risk. So there's almost no exceptions for who should get it. Are there any exceptions? Well, if you've had a life-threatening allergic reaction to one of the ingredients of one of the COVID-19 vaccines, you probably shouldn't receive that version of the vaccine. But it's important to remember that the ingredients of the COVID-19 vaccines are very different than most other vaccines. And so just because you might have had a bad reaction to a pneumonia shot or a flu shot, these COVID vaccines are very different. Um, and so it's unlikely that you'll have the same kind of reaction to the COVID-19 vaccine. So these are my general recommendations that apply to patients with all kinds of lung diseases. The next thing we're gonna talk about is four areas where there's IPF specific recommendations. So let's break down the IPF specific things. 
So first, we talk about something called immunosuppression. These are drugs like prednisone, medicines that suppress your immune system. There was a time where we thought that these drugs would be really helpful because we thought that IPF might be your own immune system attacking it, your lungs. It's very clear that in some other diseases, that is certainly what's going on. But our current understanding of IPF is that that's not really the case. And this comes from information. I'm seeing uh, some of the people in the comments are mentioning that they're losing their audio. So I can just see if I can switch to a different microphone. Uh, if I use this microphone, is the audio better? Can anyone just let me know in the comments if the audio is better now? Yes, it's better. A little better, yeah. Yeah. We lost you, Shane. I'm working on it. Are you getting me back? Yeah, yeah that's good. Perfect. Sorry for the poor audio. So it's uh, better now. Maybe you're getting me now. Yes. So the next thing we're going to talk about is immunosuppression. And this, our data from this comes from a study where we had 390 IPF patients and we broke them down into three groups. One group got immunosuppression with a, a combination of three drugs, prednisone, azathioprine, and acetylcysteine. The second group got placebo, and the third group got acetylcysteine alone. So we're going to talk about this, these two groups first. So immunosuppression, particularly this group with, uh, with prednisone, azathioprine, and acetylcysteine, the other name for that you may have heard of is called NAC or NAC. It seems that NAC is harmful in patients with IPF. This was a very surprising result when it came out in 2012. What we saw is that people on the combination treatment, you can see the red line, they had a higher chance of dying than the placebo arm. And if we looked at death or hospitalization, they had a much higher rate if they were on these treatments than if they were not on these treatments. In fact, for every three patients that were treated with a prednisone, a prednisone containing regimen for six months or longer, we think that one of them will have been harmed. So at the moment, we make a very strong recommendation that although prednisone and other immunosuppressants like azathioprine may have a role in other ILDs, in IPF, we really should avoid using it except for in very specialized cases where uh, your ILD expert feels that it's really necessary. That still leaves a question about what about this N-acetylcysteine or this NAC medicine, which is an antioxidant. This was studied in the second half of the trial where they compared placebo to acetylcysteine. And essentially they showed no difference in lung function over time. So N-acetylcysteine seemed to have really no beneficial effect. And so at the moment, we do not recommend using N-acetylcysteine. Uh, there are lots of other names for N-acetylcysteine. It's called NAC and uh, mucomist. And when you really look at the ingredients, what this is doing is acting on a pathway that uh, working on something called glutathione. And I get probably one email a month from a patient who's found on the internet some herbal remedy that they saw online. And when you really look down on it, this is really just a glutathione replacement similar to acetylcysteine. And we do not recommend that. Similarly, we do not, I see in the question, someone's asking about inhaled acetylcysteine. At the moment, there is a study going on for acetylcysteine, but most of us are not very enthusiastic because if oral acetylcysteine doesn't help, there's no particular reason to think that inhaled acetylcysteine would do better. In fact, there was a study, which I didn't have in my slides, but I'll mention because it was specifically asked here. There was a study that looked at acetylcysteine with esbriate versus placebo with esbriate. And in fact, it seems that the acetylcysteine reduces the effectiveness of esbriate. We're going to come back to what esbriate is. But in fact, it's now recommended that acetylcysteine should really not be used in anyone unless it's being done in the context of a clinical trial, because it's possible that the acetylcysteine may actually be causing harm in some patients. The next thing we're going to talk about is GERD or gastroesophageal reflux. So what is GERD? So 
we know before I talk about what it is, I'm just going to say that GERD is very common in IPF patients. We know that up to 75% of patients with IPF will have this gastroesophageal reflux. Most of them are asymptomatic. But we know that if we put acid into the mouse lung, we can actually cause fibrosis. fibrosis. And so the thinking is, is that this GERD or gastroesophageal reflux, what it is is the stomach contents going up through the throat and causing what we commonly will recall heartburn. But there's some theory that if you get enough acid reflux, that that acid reflux may actually turn around and spill into the lungs and cause the scarring. And so there's a theory that GERD may be causing the scarring that we see in IPF. On the other hand, though, there's a counter argument that suggests that maybe the GERD is not causing the IPF, but instead it's being caused by the IPF. We know that our patients with IPF have stiff lungs. So with each breath, you have to create a lot of negative pressure in the lungs to suck the air in. And so when we do this negative pressure and suck in the air, we like that we get the air into our lungs, but at the same time, we may be sucking the juices out of the stomach into the lungs. And so um, we really don't know whether GERD is the cause of IPF or whether GERD is simply just an effect of the IPF. There's been a lot of conflicting data about whether or not we should treat as, uh, acid reflux, particularly with these prescription antacid medications. In 2011, there was this retrospective study of 204 patients out of the San Francisco group and they showed that patients taking these antacid medications had a longer survival. But then a couple years later, there was another paper that was much larger. Now we're looking at about 600 patients and they showed that acid medications really didn't do much. Our group in Toronto has done what's called a meta-analysis. This is where we've looked at basically every study that was ever published at looking at acid reflux treatment in IPF. And what we found was that it, it may lead to a slight improvement in IPF-related mortality and transplant-free survival, but overall it didn't affect all-cause mortality. And so I think what we're left with with this idea of GERD is we just don't know yet. So I see a lot of patients who are on prescription antacid medications, and then I see other patients where we would say we'll only treat the acid reflux if it's symptomatic, if it's causing symptoms of heartburn and discomfort in the chest. The last area where I want to talk about, and this is where I want to finish, is on talking about antifibrotic therapy. So this is supposed to be Frankenstein, and you can see his scar here, that we're looking at treating the scar specifically. And we think of scars as being fibrosis, so we're actually targeting the scar tissue itself. And there are two antifibrotic drugs on the market in Canada. One is called perfenidone. The other name for that is esbriot. I'm gonna use the name perfenidone going forward, but just so that you can know that perfenidone and esbriot are the same thing. Perfenidone inhibits scar tissue formation by unknown mechanisms. No one really knows how it works, but it's been assessed in several phase three trials called the capacity and ascend trials. Nintenidib is the other antifibrotic drug the brand name for it is OFEV. I'm going to use those uh, two words. Those two names uh, are the same, but I'm going to use Nintendinib for the rest of my talk. That's a different antifibrotic drug that works in a different way. It's in a class called the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and it's been assessed in the two impulses studies. So what did these studies show? So the ascending capacity studies show that perfenidone slows the rate of lung function decline. What you're seeing on this graph is on the horizontal axis, we see time. On the vertical axis, we see lung volume. And you can see that in the light blue arm, the placebo arm, you can see that the lung volume is going down steadily over time. But in the dark blue bars, this is the one where people are on perfenidone, the lung function seems to go down more slowly. We still think that people get worse over time with perfenidone but it seems to happen more slowly than if they're not on the drug. Perfenidone can have side effects. We see that our patients could get nausea. That happens in about a third of patients. They can get fatigue. That happens in about a fifth of patients. 
and they can get a sun sensitive skin rash where they can burn very easily in the sun. And that also happens in about a third of patients. The other drug, nintenitib, was studied in the impulses trials. And I really like this graph because it essentially shows the exact same colors and the exact same graph, but it's different drug. You're seeing time on the horizontal, lung function on the vertical. And what you're seeing is that the light blue arm, the placebo arm, the lung function goes down more quickly than in the dark blue arm. These are the people taking nintenitib. Nintenitib has different side effects. The main side effect of nintenitib is that it can cause diarrhea or changes in bowel movements. And about two thirds of our patients will notice changes in their bowel movements. But with both nintenitib and profenadone, these side effects are usually tolerable. And in our clinic, about 85% of people are able to stay on their drugs. So then the question becomes, well, if both drugs seem to slow the disease progression, which one should I use? And the answer is, you know, one drug is not superior to the other. The choice of which drug you use really depends on your preference. And I always sort of say to patients, you know, if you're a snowbird who before COVID would go down to Florida all summer and golf and be in the sun, maybe you don't want to be on a drug that might cause you to burn very easily. On the same token, if you're someone who drives a truck long distances all the time, you may not want a drug that puts you at risk of having increased bowel movements and diarrhea. So the decision is more based on patient preference and side effects rather than effectiveness. It is important to remember that these drugs are very expensive. They cost about $40,000 per year, but the provincial formulary covers the cost in all Canadian provinces. And don't be too worried if you don't qualify. In IPF specifically, those who don't qualify for their provincial coverage can get compassion or release from the drug companies where they'll give patients the drug for free. That only applies in IPF, not other diseases where we might consider using these drugs. It's really important to say that we've talked about all these different treatments and all the things that have changed over the last 10 years. And these drugs and these things that we're doing differently now seem to work. This is a really interesting uh, retrospective that looked at a cohort of patients who were diagnosed with IPF in 2008, and then a cohort of patients who were followed in 2018. And what we see is that if you look at the survival in the 2018 group, they seem to survive better. Similarly, this was a European study that looked at people who were on antifibrotic treatment, that's the blue line, and the green line is the people who are not on antifibrotic treatment. And again, the survival seems to be better. What I think is really interesting is that the differences in survival in these two groups, which are from different parts of the world, the one on the left is from Korea, the one on the right is from Europe, you can see that our treatments seem to have a similar effect across both studies. If we look at the five-year survival, in the 2008 group who had IPF back in 2008, Back then, only about 50% of people were expected to live for five years. But if we look at what's happening now in 2018, that number is getting closer to about 75% of patients living five years. The same holds if you look at this data. And if you look at the five-year survival, that's about 60 months. You can see that in the people not on antifibrotic drugs, it's about 50% of people who survive that long. Whereas if we look at people on antifibrotic drugs, they seem to about have about 75% who are alive at five years. So I really want to be clear that I think this antifibrotic therapy has changed the landscape. I think the combination that we're no longer using drugs like prednisone and azathioprine, and now we're using antifibrotics has really changed the outlook for our patients. Just in the last moments, I'm gonna, I, I know I get asked all the time, what if patients are on these drugs and they cannot tolerate the full doses? And this has been looked at in both profenadone and nintenitib. And basically what you can see here is in the profenadone group, if you were on nothing, that's the green line, your lung function goes down at the speed of this green line. On the other hand, if you were on full dose profenadone, your lung function goes down at the speed of this red line, it's much slower. People who can't be on the full dose, but who can be on a good dose, like six tablets a day, they still seem to have a lung function drop that is much similar to the red line, the people on full dose, than the green line. 
So we do think that if you can go on higher doses, that's better. But if you do get side effects and you can't tolerate the full dose, it's probably acceptable to be on six pills a day. And in fact, in some parts of the world, like in Japan, they'll only use six tablets a day because people are generally thinner and smaller, and that's usually their target dose. In Intenative, this is a similar graph that's a bit messier, but the take home message is, is that you can see there's the overall group, the people on 100 milligrams twice a day and the people who are on 150 milligrams twice a day. And basically you can see that the lung function seems to go down by the same amount in each group. So in general, IPF is now being treated with these antifibrotic drugs. We do think they work. Um, and I'm gonna stop there. I see that there are some questions in the Q&A and I wanna answer those questions, but I know that it's, I've, I've used up my 30 minutes. We're gonna come back during the Q&A, but I now wanna hand over to Dr. Kashavji to talk a little bit about lung transplant. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to uh, come back and say, sorry for the, for the mess for the passcode, but I'm glad everybody's on. And now I'd like to read uh, Dr. Kajevji's uh, bio. Uh, he's a thoracic surgeon and director of the Toronto Lung Transplant Program. He's the surgeon in chief uh, at the James Wallace McCuthran Chair in Surgery at University Health Network. He's a professor division of thoracic Surgery and Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering and Vice Chair for Innovation, Department of Surgery at the University of Toronto. Dr. Kajevdi com completed his medical training at the University of Toronto in 1985. He subsequently trained in general surgery, cardiac surgery, thoracic surgery at the University of Toronto, followed by a fellowship training at Harvard University and the University of London for airway surgery and heart lung transplantation respectively. He joined the faculty at the University of Toronto in 1994 and was promoted to full professor in 2002. Uh, Dr. Kajaji was the inaugural holder of the Pearson Ginsburg Chair in Thoracic Surgery and served as a chair of the Division of Thoracic Surgery at the University of Toronto from 2004 to 2010. His clinical practice is in thoracic oncology, lung cancer, and lung transplantation. He has a passion for surgery and innovation research. He's a senior scientist in the Toronto General Hospital Research Institute, University Health Network. He leads a team of researchers in a foremost research program and is widely published in the field. His specific, his specific research interest is in lung injury related to transplantation. His current work involves the study of support system, molecular diagnostics, and gene therapy strategies to repair organs and to engineer superior organs for transplantation. He has served on the board of directors under International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation, the Canadian Society of Transplantation, and the American Association for Thoracic Surgery, where he is currently the vice president. He has received numerous awards for contributions to medicine, including the George Armstrong Peter Young Investigator Award, Canada's Top 40 Under 40 Award, the Colin Wolf Award for Excellence in Medicine Education, and the Lister Prize in Surgery, the highest award for research achievement in the University of Toronto Department of Surgery. He's a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and has been awarded an honorary doctorate of science degree from Ryerson University, as well as an honorary doctorate of science from Queen's University. He has received the Lifetime Achievement Award for the Canadian Society of Transplantation for his contributions in the field of lung transplantation. He has also received two Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medals and the Governor General Award for Innovation. He was awarded the Order of Ontario and also received Canada's highest civilian honour with appointment as an Officer of the Order of Canada. Dr. Kajevshi. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. And you can see my screen? Yes. Great. So uh, good evening, everyone. It's a, a pleasure and an honor to speak to all of you. And, and uh, 
I think you saw some of the advances that have been made in the medical management of, of uh, pulmonary fibrosis and, you know, advances are continuing uh, to be made in, in every aspect. What I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about uh, lung transplantation, showing you some of the results uh, that can be expected and some of the innovations that we're uh, working on in the field of, of lung transplantation. So um, I am a founding partner of three companies that we've spun out of the research that we're doing at uh, UHN and also have received uh, significant support from various other companies for clinical trials uh, that we're doing uh, currently and have done in the past. So we've done over 2,500 transplants. This was uh, updated to the middle of last year. And of that, the first time transplants are uh, 96%. Uh, sometimes you'll need a retransplant, usually because of chronic rejection. And, and uh, we've done that accounts for about 4% of our activity. And um, we actually have one patient who's, who's had a third time uh, lung transplant, again, because of rejection. So clearly, that tells you that's one of the problems we need to fix. When you look at the types of transplants we perform, uh, the majority are double lung transplants or bilateral. Uh, single lung transplants account for about uh, 20% uh, and uh, heart lung transplants 40. And we've also done various combinations of lung liver and also another first in the world uh, lung liver pancreas uh, transplant. Incidentally, the first successful clinical lung transplant in the world was done at Toronto General Hospital. And that was a patient with IPF. So uh, when you look at the activity, uh, we've steadily, since we did the first transplant in the world, increased the activity of the transplants we perform. And in 2019, did 212 transplants in a year, which really uh, makes us by far the largest uh, lung transplant in the program in the world. Um, 2020 with COVID has significantly hurt our uh, activity as, as you can imagine. Uh, COVID's number one target is the lung. So we had to be very cautious about doing lung transplants in the middle of the pandemic. And here again, you can see that the number of organ donors in our region, which has been slowly increasing, dropped sharply. And that was the biggest uh, problem in the heat of COVID. And, and this shows the activity of our program. So in 2019, you can see we do on average 15 lung transplants a month. Uh, sometimes we've had some very big, busy months. We went right down to zero in the month of April and then started picking up. And uh, you'll be happy to see that we're pretty much at our regular uh, run rate now for transplants and continuing to work at catching up. So the indications for lung transplantation about 40% are interstitial lung disease, 30% are COPD or obstructive lung disease, but 20% cystic fibrosis, and then all other lung conditions. Basically, when the lungs fail, sometimes you need to have a lung replacement. What is interesting and, and what um, Shane alluded to is the increase in incidence of uh, pulmonary fibrosis. And you can see in the 80s, it, it accounted for 35% of the transplants we performed. And now it accounts for approximately half of the transplants that we perform in our program uh, at Toronto General Hospital. And it's pretty much the same uh, around the world. With transplantation, uh, the, in the early period after transplant, the lung may not work well, that, and we call that primary graft dysfunction, or sometimes there's uh, cardiac problems or bleeding. But by and large, uh, in, in the uh, period after transplantation, the, the number one cause of death is chronic lung allograft dysfunction, which is a form of rejection and a form of abnormal healing of the, of the transplanted lung. And this basically shows again that the, the causes of death later are more rejection and infection and earlier might be complications of, of the surgery. 
So if you look at survival after lung transplantation, the, the median survival, that means 50% uh, survival uh, at, in our program is 6.65 years. And, and uh, in the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation, it's slightly less. Uh, our program has uh, been around for, for quite a long time. It, you can also see that, that uh, over the decades, from the 80s to the 90s, to the 2000s and 2010, we've gradually increased the survival after lung transplantation. But you can see the biggest gains have been made here in the early phase out of the starting blocks and, and the, the surgery and the early post-operative care. But this drop in, in cause of death going uh, out further is, uh, is really due to the allograft dysfunction, which is a key area that we're studying. I think it's really important to know, and it was, it was fantastic for me, to, you know, a couple of weeks ago to meet a lady who had a lung transplant 29 years ago. So, I mean, we do have, uh, you know, 15 to 20% of patients that are, that are well over, uh, over 25 years after a transplant, and we're aspiring to do that for everybody. If you look at all the different diagnoses that we could be doing transplants for, patients with pulmonary hypertension, even though they're higher risk at the beginning, end up being better long-term survivors. They tend to be younger patients with a median survival of 14 years. And uh, interstitial lung disease is the green line, which is sort of at the middle of the pack. For the few cases where we've been able to do lung transplants for patients with cancer, you can see that they have a, a, a reasonable survival, but certainly worse than the rest. We've also, when we started doing transplants, we would only do it in people under the age of 50. Uh, now we have no age limit uh, for transplantation and we choose patients for transplantation based on the likelihood of getting you through the surgery and into a a reasonable quality and function in your life afterwards. And you can see that the 18, less than 18 year olds, the kids, the 19 to 30, tend to do a little bit better. And this graph here is the people who are over the age of 65 when we transplant, uh, transplant them. It was slightly worse, but not uh, dramatically different. Again, our assessment is very careful uh, when we're looking at who we should transplant in. And we have transplanted many people now over the age of 70 at the time of their transplant. So I'd like to just move into a little bit in terms of some of the innovations that, that we're working on in the field. So currently around the world, the, when uh, someone signs their donor card and, and uh, becomes an organ donor, still 80% of the lungs are turned down and they're turned down at the time in the operating room or before that, where there's not enough information or, or, or evidence that the lungs are good enough and that they'll work for transplantation. And even if the 20% of the lungs that are taken, we still sometimes have lungs that don't predictably work as well and you end up being in the ICU uh, for longer. So what we did is we said, well, is there a way we could actually take these lungs that we don't have the confidence to use and figure out how to use them? Like if we could have a system where we could take the lungs out, have more time and the ability to evaluate them outside the body, we could, we could transplant more organs. And more importantly, if something's wrong with them, can we actually fix them and make them better? So the idea then is really to bring the concept of personalized medicine to the management of donor organs, uh, that not just transplanting a lung the way we found it, but can we actually make it better than the way we found it? Can we make it a lung that is more suitable for transplantation and for the, the event of rejection? And so we developed the Toronto Ex Vivo Lung Perfusion System, which is really like a mini ICU for a lung. The lung sits in a chamber, it's ventilated with an ICU ventilator, a breathing machine, and it's pumped or perfused with a, a, a basically an artificial heart, which, and, and the, the membrane on the, on, the, on the pump removes oxygen and adds carbon dioxide. 
So basically, then you can measure the lung's ability to work as a lung, which is add oxygen to your blood and remove carbon dioxide. And we created a system to support lungs for a long period of time. And this is what it looks like in our operating room. For those of you that haven't uh, seen this on Gray's Anatomy or YouTube, these are human lungs on our ex vivo system. These lungs were taken out about eight or nine hours before, and they were not uh, usable for transplantation. So here we're looking after the lungs, we're bronchoscoping the lungs, just like you bronchoscope a patient. You can go inside and, and, and sample the lungs and you can treat them. Here we're delivering uh, gene therapy using uh, an adenovirus vector to, to take a, an anti-rejection gene into the lung and we can continue to evaluate them over time and, when, and test them when the lungs are better then perform a transplant. So we brought this clinically first in the world in 2008. And uh, there's Marcelo Sippel, who was my fellow at the time, and Jonathan Young, both who did this work in the lab. And we've done seven and a, 708 cases uh, to date in our clinical program. We published this in the New England Journal, showing that we could take lungs that we wouldn't normally use and, and make them uh, usable safe, safely for transplantation. And now after doing uh, many hundreds of these cases, we've shown that in, in green here are lungs that had EBLP and, and blue are the standard lungs, that there's no difference in uh, survival or function of those lungs. And, and we significantly improved the number of lungs we use. So you can see that you know, in the early 2000s, we pushed the number of transplants by trying to use extended criteria lungs, which were lungs that didn't meet the criteria, but we knew were safe in our program to push the limits and save someone's life. But we kind of plateaued in the late 2000s uh, in, in, in not being able to, to, to get any more lungs. And in the ex vivo lung perfusion era, we fully doubled uh, the number of transplants that we perform in our program. And here you can see in blue are the lungs that go straight to transplant and in yellow are the lungs that get treated on EVLP before we transplant them. And this slide here, it shows uh, the patients waiting for transplantation. This is Ontario data. And, and here in red are the number of organ donors and you can see We've made some headway in improving that, but really not fast enough. In green are the number of people waiting for transplants, and in blue are, are patients that are, are waiting for a transplant. And you can see there's still a gap in the shortage of organs, but we're closing that gap with the innovations and research we're doing. And I think that this is probably the most important slide and hopeful one, I think, for you to see that uh, with, with time, uh, in the 1980s and, and early 90s, the surgeons quoted a 50% mortality to the patients. It means you had a 50-50 chance of getting out of the operating room with that operation. Over time, we have steadily improved the outcomes and the surgery and the management of lungs and the, and the intensive care. That last year, we did 212 transplants with 1.4% operative mortality. And that really is the state of the art uh, uh, in the world today and what you can expect from transplantation. We've also started to continue to be able to take lungs from further and further away. This is a paper John Young from our group published looking at lungs that we've stored for more than 12 hours compared to ones that we st stored for less than 12 hours just understanding that in the United States, the average is 5.8 hours uh, for transplantation. And you can see that we, we can get lungs from anywhere on the continent and, and bring them home and transplant them with equivalent results, whether it's less than 12 or more than 12 hours. And in fact, we're working in the lab. Adil Ali is one of our PhD students working with Marcelo Sippel. And, and we've actually developed a technique to store lungs for three days and then transplant them. So this allows us to, to one is to get more lungs, but maybe even can we improve the system? Uh, one of the challenges with lung transplantation is we're always doing it in the middle of the night. 
Uh, and, and that isn't a time when, when human beings work at their best. We train ourselves to do it, nurses and anesthesiologists and surgeons, but really transplantation is not an attractive career to go in with such hard work and doing it at night. So, uh, you know, can we improve the, the outcomes uh, by, by extending transplant to make it a daytime operation? This is a paper from Washington uh, University in St. Louis, where they showed that patients that were transplanted in the daytime did better than patients transplanted at night, which is quite interesting data from one center. So we have a pilot study now going on at Toronto General using our new 10 degree storage system where we bring the lungs back to the hospital. And if the transplant's gonna start after 10 p.m., we delay it to 6 a.m. And, and, and transplant the patient uh, with a fresh team uh, working in, in the daytime. And these are just x-rays of the first five patients, but uh, the important thing is if for the preservation times, remember I told you the average in, in, in America is five to six hours, first lung implanted at 10 hours, second lung implanted at 12 hours, primary graft dysfunction at 72 hours, zero. So clear x-ray, excellent lung function. Hospital length of stay of these patients, 17 days, which is our average is normally 21 days and 100% 30-day survival. And we have some science to say that a lot of these things are actually preserving the lungs better. So if a lung is, a donor lung is injured, how can we improve it? With the ex vivo system now, we have the ability to use drugs energy devices, other drugs, inhaled gases, gene therapy, and stem cell therapy. So I'm just going to go through some of the pictures of things we've done and made standard of care now. This was a donor lung that had huge blood clots in it, pulmonary embolism. We normally wouldn't be able to transplant that. We, we put the lung on EVLP. We treated the lung with Alteplase, a, a clot-breaking uh, drug, just like you treat a patient with a pulmonary embolus treated it and the lung was fine and we were able to transplant it. We did the first successful transplant from a hepatitis C positive donor to, to a man that was dying uh, of, of his lung disease, successfully transplanted him. We tried to decrease the hepatitis C on EVLP and it, didn't, it, it did decrease significantly, but he still converted and we treated him with the um, antiviral drug for hepatitis C. He's alive now without hepatitis C and with excellent lung function. But we're, what we'd like to do is say, can we actually treat these lungs ex vivo and so that we don't transmit any viral diseases? Can we sterilize the organs before transplanting them? And we developed a UVC device just to do that and started using it and a recent paper in two out of nine patients we transplanted of hepatitis C lungs, we completely sterilized the lung and, and the recipient did not seroconvert with hepatitis C and didn't need the treatment for it. So, you know, it, it isn't a, a complete success yet, but we're on our way to doing it. But more importantly is we've significantly uh, improved the, the uh, use of these lungs and transplanting lungs with hepatitis C has become very safe in a standard of care now. I, my interest uh, over the years, in fact, the reason we developed EVLP was really for uh, what we call immunomodulating the lung. Can you make the lung be ready for transplant? Can you make it look more like self so that you won't reject it? And I uh, initially was using gene therapy with adenovirus or lentivirus, two different kinds of viruses where you take the virus genes out and you put your own anti-rejection gene, IL-10 in this case, into the, into the lung, use the virus to go into the lung and have it upregulate the gene when you're ready. The most exciting thing that's happened now is CRISPR gene editing, where now instead of using a virus to take my gene in and put it in a random place, I can put it exactly where we want it or and more importantly, take a gene that's already there, IL-10, and just upregulate it. So now we can really do precision gene surgery on these lungs before transplanting them. Um, Stephen Juvet, who's one of the other respirologists in our program, uh, is looking at, uh, uh, looking at engineering regulatory T cells 
and, and cells to induce a tolerance in the lung. Um, this is the early, I'm gonna show you a little bit more of that, but this is how we use the virus to carry our gene in, and then it goes into the cell, and then your lung cells are making local immunosuppression to prevent the rejection. We used the EVLP system and showed that we could take da damaged human lungs and improve them to transplantable quality, better oxygen, better vascular resistance, and we're setting up to do a clinical trial to do the first gene-modified uh, lung transplants in the world. This is an interesting study. This is a rat that we did a lung transplant on. This rainbow color is called bioluminescence imaging, and it's imaging the gene that we put in the lung at the time of transplant. What's really interesting about this is this rat expresses IL-10 for over a year after transplant from one treatment. So we've really made an organ that is making its own immunosuppression right there. And uh, to improve the efficiency of it, we're now doing the IL-10 gene therapy into mesenchymal stromal cells, a type of stem cell, and using those cells, you can see them colored here in green, to deliver the IL-10 and upregulate it quickly at the time of transplant. This is a very exciting study that uh, Dr. Stephen Gervais is leading, where basically we'll take your regulatory T cells, your anti-rejection T cells, amplify them and grow them up and keep them in the lab frozen. When we get a lung for you, we put those cells on, on EVLP, we put the cells into the lung. So when the lung comes to you, it comes to you in the context of self so that you won't reject that lung. That's really an exciting area of immunology, immunologic uh, engineering of organs. I think the future state of transplantation is going to be uh, the use of organ repair centers. I think the, the way transplantation is run right now is really a much of a cottage industry where every hospital does their own thing. The future will be organs come into a repair center, they're optimized for the patient, and then transported out to specific patients that need it. You might think that's science fiction, but that already exists. We have the first organ repair center in the world we established in 2008, uh, now well over 10 years ago, where we do ex vivo lung perfusion. Our liver team's working on their own uh, system for ex vivo liver, and the heart and kidney people are working on it too. OR18 and OR11 are the organ regeneration laboratories at TGH. And this is what it looks like. There's the lung, which is like a patient on the table. There's the ventilator. There's the perfusion pump I showed you and a monitor for it. And we can, we can look after patients and lungs like a patient. In Silver Spring, Maryland, in partnership with United Therapeutics, we've built the first lung hospital in the world. This is lung bioengineering. It's a 2,800, 2,000, 28,000 square foot facility, which has six procedure rooms. Lungs are brought in there, repaired and, and transported back out to various centers that use this service. So Lung Bioengineering provides this service for Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Duke, Pittsburgh, Maryland, and, and so on, uh, 16 centers right now in the US routinely get EVLP treated with the Toronto EVLP system by United Therapeutics, a separate company. But we can't keep building whole operating rooms to, to manage one organ at a time. These are organ perfusion specialists in Maryland, all trained at TGH to manage a lung in, in a system like that. And what we've done now is built, a, the, reduce that whole operating room into one device so that an organ perfusion specialist can look after 10 lungs at a time instead of one lung at a time. So the future of transplantation really will be when we get a donor organ, we will evaluate it on EVLP and also do some rapid diagnostic profiling that I'm going to show you to find out what's wrong with it. If there's a problem, repair it, optimize it, and then transplant the, the organ. Just as a little aside, a part of how do you fix an organ is you have to know what's wrong with it, just like a patient. And most of the diagnostics developed for patients were developed for chronic disease and finding out what treatment you need or what chemotherapy you need the next morning is fine for those diseases. But for transplant, you need your treatment 
uh, decided within minutes. And so we've worked on a diagnostic test called TORDX to tell you if the lung is good or not. And after many years of searching for biomarkers, which we discover from assessing donor lungs, every donor lung that we take, we take a biopsy it and we, and, and we measure the gene expression and use that to predict which lungs are good or not. We've taken these biomarkers that predict function and we can give you a score and that's the SQI machine which sits in our, in our organ repair lab at TGH and they'll tell you the lung is good to go or the lung is gonna have a problem, don't transplant it. But what we found is that those um, biomarkers that tell you there's a problem with the lung are early markers of ARDS. And from reading the papers and so on, you now know that the, in, one, the injury that uh, COVID causes in the lungs is severe ARDS, adult respiratory distress syndrome or acute respiratory distress syndrome. So these markers are very relevant to COVID. And so we realized that if you test COVID patients with our test, which you can get an answer in 50 minutes in the emergency room, you can decide whether to send a patient home and they're gonna get better or admit them to the hospital. This is a really, really important thing that we have realized that the problem that is breaking the back of healthcare systems around the world is the fact that when, when, when a, a, a virus attacks your lungs, it's not the virus itself per se most times, but your host response, the inflammation that you cause in, in your response to the virus that causes the um, injury to your lungs. And the important thing is, if we could find this profile out in the emergency room, we can make a correct decision to send patients home that can have chicken soup, isolate and will get better versus patients that need to be admitted to the hospital or the ICU and need advanced therapy, which really are the minority of COVID patients. And what's, what's collapsing healthcare systems worldwide is the fact that we can't distinguish this. And for safety's sake, we admit too many patients to hospitals and end up in hallways and, and so on. So this has been an important spin-off of our lung transplant work that is helping the, the COVID uh, uh, effort. And, and we have a multi-million dollar grant where we've done this work uh, and, and proved that this test works. And we're evaluating it in Italy and Brazil as well because they have a, a, a ton of COVID patients coming in. So the future of, of organ management uh, is really a personalized medicine approach. Organs picked up at the donor hospital and, and either goes direct to transplant if it's very good. If it's very bad, it's likely going to be declined. But if it's in between, which is the majority of them, we'll evaluate it on EVLP, do our diagnostic tests. If it's good, uh, then we transplant it. If it's not good, we fix it and therefore uh, improve the lungs we use. We also have to look at transforming the entire system of organ transportation. Right now, the, the organs are in the donor hospital and they come to a recipient hospital. We, we transport by land and air of various sorts. I think in the future, you're going to see the organ repair center on the way to the transplant hospital. And I think when you think about it, why would you use a Learjet to transport something that weighs less than two kilograms like your lung? So we, we, why can't you use drones to, to transport organs? So we're working on systems to use drones to transport organs. And here in this video, I can get it to play. This is on the roof of Toronto General Hospital. And there's our drone coming in over the OPG building at uh, University of Toronto. And we flew this from Toronto Western to Toronto General, uh, carrying a dummy payload to practice uh, transporting organs for transplantation. So I'd like to close uh, by saying that uh, a lot of this innovation comes from a large research team. We have over a hundred people working on various aspects of lung injury and lung transplantation and lung regeneration, building new lungs, and uh, that do this uh, amazing work that uh, some of which I've been able to, to show to you. And also we have a large clinical team. This was 
Our, this is our lung transplant team at our annual retreat where the last one we were able to have. Unfortunately, this year's 2020 was canceled, but really a very uh, dedicated and talented team that uh, does remarkable things looking after patients with uh, end-stage lung disease and lung transplantation. Thank you very much for the privilege of presenting to you and uh, Shane and I will be happy to answer questions now. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuchetri. I know you have a hard stop at in about 20 minutes. So I'm just gonna start with the questions for you um, that I've received so far, and then I'll check online for the Q&A session if that's all right with you. Sure. Okay, our first question, uh, someone wanted to know, do we ever accept lungs from outside of Canada, like say from the US? Yeah, we, we uh, traditionally take about 40 lungs a year from the US uh, and, and certainly because of our ability to evaluate them and treat them, we can do that. So basically we'll go anywhere in North America to, to pick up donor lungs. Okay, great, thank you very much. The next question is, um, a gentleman is trying to qualify, uh, pre-qualify for a lung transplant, but um, for his urine test, it keeps coming up as containing nicotine. Um, contain, and um, he said he doesn't smoke, but he is a vegetarian. And he's saying that some of the plant-based diet mimics that. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? You know, I think the the issue is is um, you know if if someone is smoking, it's a, it's a it's a serious problem, and we have to take it very seriously. We have had people get a lung transplant and then go back to smoking and destroy a second set of lungs, uh, and and that's a problem. So, in this gentleman, uh, the the issue is you know how do you check if someone stopped smoking and. To be truthful, I, I don't know the answer of, of whether something you eat can, can uh, cross-react with the cotinin test. I don't know if Shane knows the answer to that. So I, I can't really answer whether that's a false, neg a false positive test or not. Uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just chime in that I don't know. Uh, it's sort of a little bit outside of my area of expertise. But I feel like that person could potentially ask if they could see uh, someone like a toxicologist. So in uh, Toronto, there's a doctor named David Yerlink, and there's a bunch of other uh, toxicologists who sort of have an interest in this. And I suspect that if that's really the case, we could maybe see if there's a specialist who could help sort out uh, the details of that test. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from someone who would like to know um, if uh, was scleroderma symptoms um, involving the skin, GI tract, and other symptoms still continue if they received a lung transplant? Shane, do you want to take that one? Um, so, uh, sure. I, you know, I think it's it's a it's it's a challenging answer because it it's not very clear. Everybody can kind of have a different course. Uh, so it, it's important to say that today's talk is really mostly about IPF, not scleroderma. But scleroderma is a different disease than IPF, and there's a very strong inflammation component. After a lung transplant, our patients are on super potent anti-inflammatories because they help to prevent that rejection that Dr. Kashavti was talking about. So in a lot of our patients, they do very well with the drugs that they need anyways for their lung transplant. They do very well with their scleroderma but there are some people who continue to progress despite being on those medicines. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this question is for either one of you, I guess, is it safe to um, take the COVID vaccination if you've had a lung transplant? Yes, uh, again, I think Shane answered that for the IPF patients and certainly after transplant. Um, the risk of COVID uh, in, in someone who's had an organ transplant and is immunosuppressed is so much higher that, that the, definitely when the vaccine is available, you should take it. Okay. The one, the one thing, I, the only thing I would add to Dr. Kajabji's comments, which I completely agree with is that, you know, basically I keep getting asked about if this person or if that person or if this scenario or that scenario should get the COVID vaccine. And the real answer is, is that with maybe an exception of about a hundred people in Canada, 
everyone should get the vaccine. And it's not just the IPF patients and their lung transplant patients, it's also their families and their loved ones because everyone in a circle around you wants to get the vaccine so that they can create a little pocket of safety around the patient themselves. So really everyone should get it as soon as they can. Okay, I see in the Q&A, someone is asking, now that Nova Scotia has um, passed a law that uh, it's consensual unless you decide to not donate your organs, do you think that that will mean that there'll be a more increased availability in Nova Scotia? Um, so the, the law that changed is, is very important and very significant, uh, and it's wonderful that Nova Scotia has taken the lead in it. So it's, it's presumed consent. That means you're an organ donor, unless you choose not to be. Everywhere else in Canada, you're not an organ donor unless you choose to opt in and be an organ donor. And the problem with opting in is that most of us don't think about it and we don't address it and we don't talk to our family about it. And when someone dies, everybody's distraught and they just don't want to talk about anything and they just choose no. And then we, and organs get wasted. So opting in, you know, the, the opt out system of presumed consent, I think is very helpful because it, it, it sort of forces people to address it. If you don't want to be an organ donor, you can choose to not be an organ donor. You have to say it. And, and I think the answer will be that we will get more organ donors in Nova Scotia and, and hopefully the rest of Canada will follow along too. Okay, Dr. Kishasha, can you talk about, is there a central system for organs that are available in North America? How do these systems work and, and you know, how is it communicated so that you, you know that there's an organ that might be possible? Yeah. Um, there, there's a, a good system, uh, and uh, it, it, it's it's um, separate in the U.S. and Canada. And I'll tell you how they relate. So, um, first of all, um, yes, every uh, person who's a recipient wanting a transplant of any organ is on a wait list, and then there are criteria for wait list priority. In lungs, uh, the first thing uh, you is the the blood type. So you have to be an A, B, or O and, and a matched blood type. And in lungs, the other part that's unique is the size. Like we can't fit different size lungs in, in people that are very largely different in size. So we match by blood type, then size, and then severity of illness, status one, two, or three, with three being the sickest in hospital on a ventilator or an artificial lung support. So this list is, is kept by the Organ Donor Management Organization. In Ontario, it's Trillium Gift of Life. In Alberta, it's Hope uh, Alberta and, and various other ones. And they have those lists and organs are, are allocated first locally. And then if they're not used locally, they would be offered out. So if, if there's a, a lung in, in, in Calgary, it would be offered to Edmonton then Vancouver, and then if Vancouver and Edmonton don't want it, they'll offer it to Toronto. So okay. it, it, it manages in reasons. Now, in terms of sharing between the US and Canada, it, you have to have it turned down by all programs in one country before it's offered to the other. So when, we, when I said we use 40 lungs a year from the US, it's because the 70 uh, lung transplant programs in the US have not uh, turned it down and therefore they, they're allowed to offer it to us. Okay, and how is it determined if you get a double lung versus a single lung transplant? So, so there, there are some diseases um, like uh, infectious lung diseases or in, of various kinds uh, that, that you really have to take both lungs out uh, in order to do a transplant and, and uh, because otherwise you'd be immunosuppressed and have a big source of infection in your chest still in the, in the lung that's left. And then there are other conditions where the, the pressure in the lung arteries, the pulmonary arteries goes up. And um, in those uh, conditions, it's, it's, uh, it's very challenging to do a single lung transplant. Uh, and, and so we do a double lung transplant if you have pulmonary hypertension. And some patients with pulmonary fibrosis get pulmonary hypertension as the disease worsens. The lucky thing about pulmonary fibrosis is you can do a double or a single lung transplant. And, and we're, 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 
pretty lucky. Like the lung is a paired organ and we often take one lung out for cancer and people live a long life and normal and good function with, with having one lung taken out. And similarly, having one lung, lung transplant has excellent outcomes uh, if, if you're lucky enough that you can do it. We usually tell IPF patients that could have a single or a double that we list them for both if they could have both. Because sadly, some people will die without a transplant, without getting a lung. And if they have the ability to get a single lung, they have a better chance of getting a transplant before dying of not having access. Okay. Uh, the next question we have, uh, someone wants to know, they've already had two stints put into their heart for surgery. Does that mean they'll be disqualified for a lung transplant? So um, when we first started doing transplants in the 80s and 90s, you, you basically had to be have sick lungs and be otherwise perfect uh, to get through. Um, that has totally changed. So Many times if there's um, some heart disease or other organ function that can be optimized, we still will consider um, that. So patients with uh, coronary artery disease and have stents, uh, or we discover the coronary artery disease as part of the workup for a transplant, we will do the stents or do a bypass at the time of lung transplant. Now, sometimes it's just too much. Like if, it, if it's affected the function of the heart, and you still have uh, ischemic disease or blockages of the coronary arteries, uh, the, a lung transplant operation is a huge stress on the heart. So at some point that could become a problem, but it's not a contraindication anymore. Okay, well, this follows that question is that um, someone had seen a presentation where they were informed that um, it's a shorter healing time when it's only a single lung transplant. And so they were thinking uh, perhaps that, you know, if you went the single lung transplant route, that maybe more patients could have a lung. Yeah. So, so that is an area for sure. A double lung is sort of the same operation done twice. Uh, so it's longer, it is, it is more invasive in a way and so on. And sometimes also in very complex patients, we can get through just a single lung and, and, and get them over to the other side. So, so there is that balance of, of, of one, it's less complicated. And in and, and some of the older, frailer patients, sometimes we can get them through a single lung pretty well and get them to being off oxygen and, and having you know, better quality of life. So, um, and, and also if you do more single lungs, can you share more organs uh, with other patients? And those are important considerations. Uh -huh. uh, is it still the case that a heart lung transplant is easier technically to perform than a double lung transplant? Yeah, <laughs> surprisingly it is. It's, it's a really easy operation, but it's not a, an operation we need very often because really, you do a heart transplant when you have a failing heart and you do a lung transplant when you have a failing lung. And you only need to do a heart lung transplant when both organs have failed beyond management. And so out of 200 lung transplants a year, we might do one or two heart lungs really. Okay. And someone wanted to know, um, do you give a, like a male lung to a male or a female lung to a female? or does it matter? Um, the, the sex matching of the lungs doesn't really matter. The, and, and really it's the size issue. So we, don't, we, we basically look at the, the actual size of your lungs in your chest and the predicted size of your lungs uh, based on your height, weight, and, and, and sex. There's, there's formulas to predict that, it's to give you a lung that's appropriate for your size and, and it doesn't matter. Okay, are, are there any other questions for uh, Dr. Shafakchi? Is there any more? I just would, would like to address one question. Uh, a couple of patients, uh, people have asked questions about IPF running in families and, and uh, uh, you know, and, and the risk of it and so on. I think, you know, people that, that uh, have IPF in the family, they should see someone like Dr. Shapira or other members of our team, Dr. Binney and others that specialize in IPF. 
because as you know, the new treatments uh, coming along as, as Dr. Shapiro has shown you are really important. I mean, hopefully you never need a transplant. Uh, the other part of it is, is we, we are working hard at the research to find out what causes IPF. And as Shane said, every IPF isn't the same. It's all lumped in as a lung that's ultimately scarred, but how it got to that scarring is a little different in different patients and so on. And so as part of our lung transplant program, every lung we take out, we get permission from the patient to take a biopsy of it, to study it, to, to say what causes IPF. And likewise in families that have IPF in them, we can learn more about the disease. So I think it's really important to hook up with a specialty IPF center. If you are a family that has this, and one is you'll get obviously specific, specific treatment for it, targeted for it, and early assessment so that we, you know, if you do need a transplant that you're assessed early enough that you can have a successful transplant. Thank you very much. Um, now I have some questions for Dr. Shapira. Um, in your presentation, you talked about the both drugs that are currently on the market. Are there any other new therapies coming on the market? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there are some uh, really exciting things that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, I don't think we're there yet, um, but there are currently about four drugs that are in what we call phase three trials. You know, lots of patients are um, starting to get used to this idea because they saw it in the COVID-19 vaccines, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three. The last stage before these uh, drugs come to market is a phase three trial. And there are many, many drugs in phase two trials. Um, those are drugs where we don't yet know if it's really gonna work, but we're studying them. But there's about four different drugs that are in phase three trials. There's um, a drug called Pentraxin 2, a drug called GLPG 1690, one called PBI 4050, and another one called Pemrevlimab. And these four drugs are all actively doing phase three trials. I think it's exciting to think about what might be coming down the pipeline, but the reality is if we think about the timing of this, if a study is currently in a phase three trial, that probably means that it's not gonna to come to market in Canada for at least another two to four years. It then will not be covered by insurance for about another one to two years and won't be covered by provincial formularies for probably about another year or two after that. So the best case scenario of one of these IPF drugs is that it's sort of available broadly for use in Canada in about five to seven years. I don't think there's anything that's immediately on the horizon. Thank you. Uh, someone wanted to know, what's the most uh, important thing one can do to prevent or delay further prog progression of their um, disease? So, you know, I get asked all the time about, you know, what can I do to make my lungs better? You know, can I, what can I eat? What supplement is there? What thing online, if I just hunt long enough, will I find that magical cure that's gonna only be $50, but your drugs are $50,000? What am I missing? And the answer is, is that there isn't an answer like that. The reality is, is that IPF is unfortunately a very unpredictable disease. Um, and at the moment, mostly what we have to offer our patients is the treatments we talked about today. Antifibrotic therapies for the lungs well, we do other things to keep the rest of the body healthy. Exercise to keep the muscles strong, psychosocial supports to keep people motivated, vaccine to keep, uh, keep them healthy, um, avoiding smoking. Those are really the best things that you can do. Beyond that, I would say don't focus on trying to do things that probably aren't gonna make a difference for your lungs. Instead, get out there, live your life and enjoy your moments and you know, eat an ice cream. Don't worry, it's not gonna hurt your lungs. Um, and focus on enjoying what you can. Okay. Well, I guess this question sort of, you sort of answered it, but they wanted to know, you know, why is it that they were fine for two years and, you know, no progression, no further, you know, downward spiral. And then all of a sudden um, it goes, you know, a huge drop. Like they haven't done anything different. They don't understand why all of a sudden they've, um, you know, experience an exasperation and has a huge drop. 
Yeah, and we talked a little bit about this. I know a, a lot of the folks uh, were not able to get on at the very beginning, so some folks weren't able to see. But, you know, we talked at the beginning about how IPF is just a very unpredictable disease. We know that the way that your lungs have behaved over the last year or two doesn't really predict how your lungs are going to behave over the next year or two. We do know, and I mentioned, that if people's lung function drops by about 10%, that does predict a bad prognosis. You know, people whose lungs drop by 10% in one year, they're more likely to get worse or even die in the next year, but that's not universal. Some people will get stabilized and stay that way for a long time. At the same time, other patients who were going along, chugging along just fine will suddenly get worse. And we really don't understand why these happen. There's a lot of theories why people will suddenly have a step down. A lot of it has, uh, we think that it probably has to do with picking up different viral infections. Um, if you look, the rates of these sudden worsenings are much higher in the virus season, like January to March. We see a lot more of it than we do in the summer months when there's less viruses around, but no one really knows. And so all we say to our patients is that if you have IPF and you've got, let's say a six month follow-up appointment with your doctor, but you're feeling a lot worse now don't wait six months to see your doctor and be really sick. Like Dr. Kashavji mentioned, you know, there's things we might be able to do, change treatments, get you a lung transplant. If you're feeling, you know, a little worse for a day or two, you wait it out. But if you really feel like each week you're feeling worse than the week before, you call your lung doctor, you get in there, you get seen and see if they can find something that they can try and intervene and fix. Okay. Uh, I know that Dr. Kashavji has said that, you know, um, about genetics for people who have IPF. So someone wanted to know uh, if their spouse passed away from this disease, does that mean that they should ask their children to do some kind of genetic testing to find out if, if they have this uh, genetic disease as well? Yeah, I saw on the Q&A and in the chat, there was lots of questions about the genetics. Mm -hmm. I will say that we know a ton more about the genetics of IPF than we did uh, five or 10 years ago. And there are now very clearly certain mutations in the genes that increase your risk of getting IPF. In particular, I know we also have a big cohort today from the East Coast, and it, it, it's been very clear that within the East Coast, there's a lot more of the familial kind than there is um, on the West Coast of Canada. There's a lot more of that, those genes in that group uh, than we see in other parts of the country. However, even though we know these genes exist, we still don't entirely understand how they cause pulmonary fibrosis. And not everybody who has the gene will get lung fibrosis. And so it's a real dilemma about whether or not you should get genetic testing. The problem is if we do genetic testing on all the family members who don't have IPF, then what we'll find is that there'll be people who will now be labeled as having this gene, but not all of them will get fibrosis, but all of them will have the bad effects of knowing that you have that gene. They will all find that it is difficult to get insurance. They may all find that it, like either life insurance, disability insurance, or even private drug coverage insurance. They will all find that they live the rest of their lives with a little cloud over their head. And yet right now we don't do anything. If we find out you have the gene and you come to my clinic, there's no treatments for that. So those people will live with that cloud over their head without any specific interventions. So instead of checking the genes of everybody who is a family member of someone who has IPF, instead what I recommend is if you have a family member with IPF, gene or no gene, if you start to get lung symptoms, coughing and breathlessness that last for more than about three months, you should be asking to see a lung specialist in your local community and you should mention to them that you have a family history of pulmonary fibrosis. And if it's a lung specialist, they'll know what that is, they'll know what to do. And that's probably just as useful as spending a couple thousand dollars to get a genetic test that probably won't change things very much. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just gonna wrap up by answering a couple of people who had asked, when are they gonna be able to get the vaccination? So I just wanna let everyone know that the Canadian Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation in a joint um, statement with the Canadian Thoracic Society and all the other respirology respiratory organizations are going to be advocating um, that um, respiratory patients be put on the top priority of the list to receive a vaccination. And also I see a couple of people are asking about 
if you're not IPF, how do you get access to the drug? I just want to say that uh, Canadian Polymer Fibrosis Foundation, again, is also advocating across the country to say that, um, you know, the only difference between a PF and an IPF is that we don't know what caused your PF versus the PF where we know. And so we, again, are also um, advocating that that drug be approved so that OFEV, that, um, so you could get, gain access to that as well. So I just want everyone to know that. So I'm just going to conclude tonight our presentation. I, I thank both of you for being on tonight. And this webinar will be on our cpff.ca website. Thank you very much and good night.